Good evening. We're mashup artists, so we don't usually do this sort of thing. We very rarely use our own words, preferring to steal other people's. Um, if you've never seen any of our videos before, it's basically this sort of thing. Let's get on with it, shall we? I've got a nice treat lined up for you. You might know that this week is uh, London Fashion Week. I'm going there with my family. I want to be right on the catwalk, jumping and flipping backwards and forwards, packaged in the most horrible way, in tight panty girdles and a 30 quid skirt. And then I'm going to stand up and say, hello, girls, how's my pants doing? Do you think that appeals to a woman? I don't give a shit. Can I ask you a direct question? Would you like to kiss me? Yes or um, no? No. Well, no, no not no. Well, yes. Yes, I, no, I won't. Well, I'm asking you the question. I, I, you know, don't take it personally. Do you want a kissy kissy my mouth? Yes or no? The answer to that from me is yes. I like that answer. You're high. I love the lips. Even we have to admit, this is a fairly strange way to fail to make a living. As we don't normally give le lectures, we weren't sure what to talk about, so apologies if this gets self-indulgent. The clip we just showed is one of the most successful things we've ever done, but that appeared online about 10 years after our first release, and about 15 years after we first started working together. Back then, Cassette Boy was very different. We didn't call ourselves Cassette Boy for a start, although we did use cassettes which looked like this. Stop me if I'm going too fast. <laughs> it all started with us making compilation tapes for our friends. These tapes would have a minute or two of music, usually banging techno, it was the mid-90s after all, followed by a snippet of talking nicked from the TV or the radio. We were influenced by radio comedy like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and On the Hour. And by influence, I mean that we just nicked bits of it. This sort of thing. Belgium, Belgium, Belgium. It's got a bit more sophisticated since then. <laughs> the other main influence on what we were doing was the limitations of the equipment we were using. We couldn't layer sounds on top of each other or change the pitch of sounds. We couldn't do anything really other than take one sound and put it next to another one. Limitations like this can be very useful. When starting this lecture, I stared at the blank piece of paper for hours, paralyzed, because I could fill it with any words I liked. If I'd been limited to making a lecture by rearranging a handful of words I'd managed to tape off EastEnders and The One Show, it might have been a bit easier, although filling the 15 minutes might have been a struggle. We're limited to using the words we've managed to record, which really helps the creative process. I remember in one piece, we described a sex act as being like strictly come dildos which is a phrase I'm still very happy with. Given a blank piece of paper and a million years to fill it, I doubt if either of us would have written Strictly Come Dildos. But give us a tape of someone who says Strictly Come Dancing and later on says Dildos, well, it writes itself. We took the one sound, then another sound concept as far as we could, adding one word at a time, our fingers a blur over the record and pause buttons. Sadly, none of our tape decks made it to retirement age. They all died in the line of duty, some of them quite horribly. Pause buttons broke through overuse, mechanisms snapped. Eventually, the one in this picture here ended up making a terrible screeching noise of metal on metal as it recorded. We had to wear headphones so we could hear what we were doing over the noise of the tape recorder. We made more and more tapes, and the snippets of talking became more dominant, and the music disappeared almost entirely. For example, this clip of the two fat ladies. This is the meat. This is the meat. Lovely piece of meat. Keep their Just meat going. going. Veal, pork, animals, chicken's liver, chicken's liver, chicken's liver, liver. loin of pork, bacon, ham, pigs, pork loves it. The liver embraces it. Beef stew. A rabbit stew. Soup and stewed, soups and stewed, beef stew, beef stock, chicken stock, lamb stock. It's always a good idea to have a pie. <laughs> the full version of that goes on for over three minutes, so think yourselves lucky that this is a short lecture. It wasn't until 1997 that we did anything that was actually about something. In those days, before internet file sharing, material was hard to come by. Today, if we want to cut up The Apprentice, we can download 100 episodes in the blink of an eye. Back then, we actually had to go out and buy a Phil Collins album so we could make this tiny joke in a Tim Westwood cut-up. 
DJ, DJ, my man, DJ. Just, you know what I'm saying. Break it down, flavor, flavor. Just, you know what I'm saying. Pick up yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, for real. Studio, studio, studio. Super, super studio. <laughs> Worth it, I think you'll agree. <laughs> so in 1997, we were limited to what we could record off the TV ourselves. And then Princess Diana died. And we realized that every radio station, every TV channel, would be talking about the same thing for days and days and days. We started recording. One tape deck recorded to a TV tuned to BBC One, another to a video on ITV, a third recording Radio 4. It's fair to say that the resulting mashup wasn't in the best of taste. It's not something that necessarily stands up these days, but looking back, it was a turning point for us. It was the first time we'd had a target which led indirectly to videos like this one. I want to say something to everyone in this hall. Who's going to create that fairer society? No, not the Conservative Party. That is not our concern. Because we are going to kick the sick. The Conservatives are back in government. Eventually, we abandoned tape decks and started using computers and everything became much harder. One of the advantages of tapes was that once we'd made an edit, we couldn't change it. Theoretically, we could rewind and re-record, but that always sounded a bit messy. The analog method forced us to keep moving onward in a straight line. But using computers meant that the edits became much smoother. We went from one word, then another word, to one syllable, and then another syllable. We were able to make more or less any word we liked. And those are some of the words that we like. We discovered that you could usually get a laugh by making celebrities swear. It's fortunate that swear words are so basic. They're usually one syllable and easy to construct from bits of other words. We actually made a rule that we were no longer allowed to shorten the word country because it was too easy. <laughs> there is one exception. The word wank is surprisingly difficult. I don't think we've ever made a satisfactory wank. It's actually easier to make masturbate, but more of that later. So having moved on to computers, we were now able to do this sort of thing. It was nearly midnight. Harry Potter was lying in bed. Harry pulled out his dick. He looked at it happily for a few seconds, noticing that it was rather thicker than usual and had grown a few inches over the last year. Fingers trembling slightly, Harry grabbed his package and pulled. As long as he didn't leave spots of spunk on the sheets, his aunt and uncle need never know. Going digital had another massive advantage. We'd never have to buy a Phil Collins album ever again. <laughs> the availability of material online opened up new possibilities for us. A piece like this next one, which would have cost us well over £100 if we'd bought all the raw material, was now essentially free. <laughs> Light my fire. Set the place on fire. I'm a fire starter. Fire. 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 Get the fire brigade. Who put water on my fire? Fire. Water. Fire. And water. 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 That's my fire. Really, really gone out. Go on. So we didn't actually have to buy a Simply Red album at the end there, which was very good. Wholesale theft like this did have implications. We were now walk working towards an album, which we wanted to sell in actual shops. Every second of that album was technically owned by someone else. We sampled Frank Sinatra, Jamie Oliver, the BBC News, 20 different songs in the clip I just played. Clearing all of those samples was a logistical and financial impossibility, so we didn't bother. We released the album anyway and hoped for the best. We did decide that it would be a good idea if we stayed anonymous. And although so far no one at least has tried to sue us, we still don't show our faces in public. These days it's for fun as much as anything. But because no one knows what we look like, it meant that we could do a gig at the Victoria and Albert Museum whilst my colleague here was in Australia. I appeared as Posh Spice and we got someone else to stand in as David Beckham. 
I couldn't make a gig in Bristol, so my colleague dressed as the wrestler Big Daddy, while someone else filled in as giant haystacks. Once, we did a gig in London while both of us were in Australia, and two people, one of whom I've still never met, appeared as us, dressed as, I think, Bin Laden and Jimmy Savile. Before the allegations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although we've never been sued so far, our work is still illegal. From a career point of view, it was a pretty dumb move to dedicate 20 years of our lives to copyright infringement. <laughs> it's as if we decided to become sculptors who only carve things out of massive blocks of cannabis resin. <laughs> or chefs who specialize in omelets made from peregrine falcon eggs. Now, I would argue that our work shouldn't be illegal. Watching our Alan Sugar mashup is not the same as watching an episode of The Apprentice. Hearing our Susa Studio gag is not going to make you think, I don't need to buy that Phil Collins album now. I've basically heard it all. <laughs> the fact that our chosen form of expression is illegal has, surprisingly enough, been a massive hindrance to us. Because we rarely get paid to do what we do, it's hard to justify the immense amount of time it takes us to make an album or a video. We'd love to make a video album, but unless one of us wins the lottery, we'll never be able to afford the time to do it. Sadly, it hardly seems worth even putting videos on YouTube anymore. The other day, I realized that after nearly five years online, our apprentice video has disappeared because of a copyright claim. On the rare occasions when we do get commissioned to make something, it usually falls through. This next clip was commissioned by Channel 4, but it was pulled at the last minute. Um, it's still a bit rough around the edges because it was never finished properly, and this has never actually been seen anywhere before, I don't think. This is an important warning. You may not want to see what happens next. This is a comic take on Channel 4 News. Now, some news just in. Prince Harry has shot the UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, in the head. Well done, thank you very much. That's Channel 4 News. Never knew all that. I mean, what a lot you learned. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there is an upside to our failure to make a living. Because it was clear we could never make a career out of Cassette Boy, we never took it remotely seriously, concentrating on mucking about and having a laugh. We just did whatever seemed funny at the time. This hat, for example. After either three or five albums, depending on how you count them, we decided to call it a day. We were going to do just a bit more editing, this time with pictures as well, to teach ourselves how to edit video in the hopes of getting proper jobs. The third of those videos was Cassette Boy vs. The Bloody Apprentice, which got as many, as, as many hits as we'd sold albums in one afternoon, and went on to be viewed over five million times before it got taken down the other day. We decided to stick at it a bit longer. So I've got one last video for you. Uh, this one isn't on YouTube, um, because it's nice to have something unseen to play at events like this. Hearing people laugh in person is much more satisfying than reading lol in YouTube comments. <laughs> so this is the last one. I'm getting ready to do something I've never done before. It's called masturbation. These days, masturbation promises to change everyone's life for the better. Ah, that's better. Thank you. <laughs>